Let us bow our heads just a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we are here tonight. We are, we are grateful that we know your presence is here with us. Now we pray that you'll minister to each one of us as that we have need. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. It does feel good to have these microphones alive. I was so sorry to kind of mess that up yesterday, the message that I wanted you to get so bad. And I wanted you to be sure to see that, this, the anchor that we have. We are not anchored by a church. We're anchored in Christ. You see. He is that only way. He's the only place of safety. The only place that God ever put his name. And God said he would meet the people in the place he chose to put his name. Not in any gate, but in the gate that he chose. And in that place, he would meet the people in there only. And we find out that God never put his name anywhere but in his son, Jesus Christ. As the son always takes the name of the father. And now you say, well, what does that apply today? Each one says I'm in Jesus. He is the word. That in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Again, it's also written in Revelation, the 19th chapter, when we seen him coming, the bride and groom, his vesture dipped in blood, his name was called the word of God. He is the word of God. And that's, he is the quickening power. He is the Holy Spirit. Is that the the dynamics that comes into the mechanics of words that make it live. And it all has to work together or it just won't work. It's got to take the whole Bible, the whole Christ, the full gospel. I want to say to this panel that I watched on television last night knowing it was going to be on. And I watched it. I want to comment these brethren, uh, the ones that was on that panel, uh, such a masterly piece of answering questions. And I'm a very much of a critic, you know, anyhow, but there wasn't nothing to criticize there. It was absolutely <laughs> genuine. Wine. I could agree with that 100%. <laughs> Them answers was right to the point. I certainly did appreciate that. I only wished I had a film to show him a church at home. <laughs> that it was really nice. And I'm so thankful to know that, that God has dealt out in the other realms besides our own Pentecostal group and are picking up man, those seed of God that's been laying out there all these years waiting for the light to shine across them. And it also gives us a warning, friends, to know that Jesus said when this sleeping virgin had begun to come in to buy oil, that was when the bridegroom was coming. So we can see by that, when we see the Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran coming in to get the oral, then that was the hour that the bridegroom came. Let's remember that. I never had Billy, my son, to say such to me as he did just a few moments ago. He said, Daddy, I don't tell you what to do. I don't mean to impress you by anything. I said, Daddy, for whatever you do, put all your time for them sick people. He said, I've never seen so many sick people. He said, I gave out 200 cards in just a moment or two. He said, there's so many people sick. He does, very seldom ever tells me that. And then I come tonight with some little notes wrote down here and some comments upon the oncoming judgment. And knowing that we're sitting here tonight with the very wrath of God jerking beneath us and soon she'll swipe it up. And knowing that the wrath of God is waiting just at the moment it will be said, it'll be over for millions. And knowing that in my heart and knowing it to be so. And then we see so many sick pressing and pulling. I thought tonight most of them are Christians. And let me say to this, you children of God, whatever you do, you let everything else go. You serve God day and night with all your heart. You you can feel there's something wrong. You can tell it as you walk in the streets. You can, and wherever you go, you know if you're spiritual, and I know you are. And I was talking to a man, Brother Stromy, 
I don't know whether Tony's here or not. He, he was a uh, uh, Tony Salami. Uh, <laughs> Salami Salami. No, I got the wrong Tony. Uh, no, and that's the wrong Tony. This is the Tony of, of, of Tucson. What is his name? Strami. Str- I know a Salami Salami or something. I get on <laughs> In his story the other day was a man came in. It was very striking. He uh, was saying something that brought back a memory to me. When I, last time I was in, in India, where I think the Lord gave us the greatest crowd we ever had at one time, was in Bombay. We couldn't even find places nowhere to put them. Tens of thousands and thousands of people. And just before we got there, there's a newspaper uh, translated, uh, well, it was, uh, India's a bilingual country. It was, it was the uh, uh, English paper and it said, well, the earthquakes must be over. The birds are flying back to their home and their nest. A few days before the earthquake come, it tore down the fences and things. The little birds find themselves shelters in the rocks and build their nests and in the afternoon or in the midday, when the sun's real hot, all the animals stand around those rock walls to get in the shade. And for two days, the birds stayed out in the trees. They wouldn't come to their nest. And two days, the animals, the sheep and cattle, they would not come around in the afternoon and hang around those walls. They, they stayed out in the field and leaned against each other for shade. And then all at once, an earthquake. They just shook the walls and tore down the buildings. And See, if those little birds had been in there, they would have perished. The cattle had been standing beneath it and the sheep, they would have perished. God warning nature. A few days ago down in Brother Tony's store, I was listening to a man there that said, when this earthquake had taken place in Alaska, he was fishing down what we call Stony Point, Mexico. And he uh, said the birds wouldn't feed and the, the fish wouldn't feed. There was something wrong, and all at once the earthquake broke loose. And the other day when that happened over in India, or wherever it was, he said he was fishing again. He thought, well, it's strange. Those fish feed about this time. There's not a roll in the water nowhere. The water is just as quite perfect time for the fish to feed, but they didn't feed. And all the birds that's usually out there, the gulls picking up these fish and things, was all walking around on the bank, huddling one against another. In a few moments... The sea moss from the bottom began to come up like that. Earthquake had happened across the other side of the earth. See, them fish know there was something wrong. Something was fixing to happen. Those birds knew the same. Surely, if God gives a fish and a bird discernment, how much more should he give his, his children? We know that we're at the end time. And judgment is waiting. So let's be real reverent. Flee to God with all your heart. O Capernaum. Thou who art exalted into heaven will be brought down into hell. And today she lays beneath the bed of the waters. Just remember and pray. Now, tonight I want to read a place here in the scripture just for a few moments. We're going to pray for the sick. Billy said he gave out a bunch of prayer cards. And he gave out some yesterday and I never got to any of them last night. And I wondered, when the Holy Spirit came, it's just... You can't make it work. It's just like a little lever. You pull yourself into a gear. You're the one does that operating of the Holy Spirit. Not me. You do that yourself. So last night I noticed even in the sermon, it never picked up with the people just right. They didn't seem to take to it. I have found it here lately. It seems like more or less, just as I was speaking, laying hands upon the sick. They know we should realize that in us, has been given, we who believe Jesus Christ and been born of his spirit and filled with that quickening power, that power that's in you by laying on hands on the others like the disciples did and down through the age, it absolutely healed the sick, raised the dead, it showed visions, prophecies, and the very same spirit that lived amongst the early apostles is living in the church today, working the very same things. And as quick as we can recognize that, See, no matter how much it's a working, you've got to recognize that and believe that. It won't do one bit of good until you do believe it. But the moment you believe it, your troubles are ended. That's true. Now, let us 
turn in the scripture. I was sitting out there a few moments ago, jotted down a few more scriptures to change my uh, text for the night. And uh, I want to read some out of the Word of God, out of the book of St. Luke, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 40th verse. Listen now, I'm going to read extensively. And it came to pass that when Jesus was uh, returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. Would not that be a fine attitude for the company tonight? And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of a synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman, having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all of her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee. And sayest thou who touched me? Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. And while he spake, there certain one came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he was come into the house, He suffered no man to go in, save Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept, wailed her. And he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all out and took her by the hand and called the maid, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she rose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents was astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Now let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, as we read this word, we know that that is truth. This happened. It's not some mythical story that we would read out of Maybe a newspaper or some book of fiction, but this come from the book that we know to be the Word of God. We believe it happened. We believe that this Jesus that did this notable thing two instants here of the woman with the blood issue and the dead child. We believe that he is God's son, that God raised him up from the dead and has presented him to us tonight in the person of the Holy Ghost, and we believe that he is here with us tonight, believing that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His compassions reach out to the people, and as the people reach for him, the same results that was given in that day will be given this day. Grant it again, Father, that uh, we might have a fresh anointing, as Brother Shakarian asked us sincerely a, a while ago, and asked the audience to believe. We are asking again in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to speak just for a few moments, and that will be just a few moments, because I want to get them people with the prayer cards up here and pray for them. And omitting any other thing, but just praying for the sick. But before we pray for the sick, we've got to get the people in that attitude. It's the attitude that always brings the results. It's the attitude that you take towards God. Here's a woman touched his garment. She was healed with a blood issue. A soldier spit in his face and put a crown of thorns on his head and felt no virtue. It's your approach, the attitude. 
That's what it takes. And that's what it is tonight, dear friend. It takes the attitude. We are and believe that we are in the presence of Jesus Christ. But it's your attitude that brings the results. The mechanics is here, and so is the dynamics. If you can just get started, God will do the rest. Now, this subject that I want to speak on for a few moments is proving His Word. Now, that's a great thing to think of that, proving His Word. Now, God's just as able to prove His Word tonight as He ever did prove it. And the Bible also said, prove all things. Hold fast to that what's good. Now, you've heard, no doubt, heard the old proverb, prove it, I'll believe it. But that doesn't hold true. Uh, Many times I've seen many things proved that was absolutely scientifically even proved, and yet people didn't believe it anyhow. I was talking with a man here not long ago. He was talking about divine healing. He said, I wouldn't believe it. I don't care what would happen, how much proof you could show of it. I still don't believe it. Well, certainly, no matter what you'd ever do for that man, he, he's lost. He cannot believe. There's nothing in him to believe. I just had a, a little experience here about a week ago. As you all know that I, I hunt. And when I come back from my meeting, I've been lion hunting. And I, after I moved into Arizona, it, it's good. I like to hunt big game. And I like to get out amongst nature and watch it. Now, I'm not a killer. I just hunt. So I, I don't like to destroy game. I, I don't think it's right. I think it's just as much sin to kill game when you're not using it and go use it for a purpose as it would be to kill anything else. I believe it's wrong. We shouldn't do that. God gave it to us for food and for purposes, and we should not uh, destroy it. But now what the law says you can take, all right. Just don't waste it. And I'm down there, the season's out for everything else. Lions kill a lot of cattle. I know a lot of ranchers up in the country, and every time they get a kill, well, they call me. When a lion gets among sheep, a certain friend of mine the other night lost about $3,500 in one night by one lion, killing just lambs. He got in. Of course, the rest of the lions are going to have to pay for his sin. And so uh, I got the lion. And so it was a great big lion, (laughs) nine foot long, weight close to something. So it was was a good big lion. Then I went from the country of Arizona up into Utah to hunt. And so I was told that there was uh, people up there. The man that I was going to hunt with was a government trapper. And for goodness sakes, don't mention anything about religion around him. He said he was really a rough fella. And I said, well, I told the man I was going with, I said, I won't mention it. He said, don't say preacher. If you do, you'll never get to go hunting. He wouldn't take you. He said, I hunted with him three days and slept with him every night, eat with him every day. And he never even said, good morning. How do you do? You want something to eat? Wash the dishes? Nothing. He said, now just don't say nothing about it. I said, I won't say a word. So I didn't tell him I wouldn't pray, but I just kept on uh, telling him that I'm... I uh, pray. So when we got up there, the man was a very hard character, and I didn't think he believed anything, and he just lost a baby a few nights before that, a stillborn baby. So we went hunting, and on the second day, the man I was hunting with had told him, said, I get to hunt everywhere around the country. So when the other hunter was with me, had left, we were way on top of peaks where we just run a line till we got him in the rocks, and he had got away. And so... Uh, we were sitting there waiting for the dog to return. And this man said to me, he said, uh, uh, the other hunter, your friend tells me that you get to hunt everywhere. Uh, you got plenty of money? I said, I guess it's none of my business. And I said, oh, I said, there isn't plenty of money. I said, I, I'm sponsored. And he said, oh, I see. He said, well, I guess it's none of my business again. But said, are you with the firm that sponsors you? <laughs> He's pulling it right out of me. I promised I would. <laughs> so I said, uh, I said, no, sir, I'm a preacher, a missionary. He said, a what? And I said, a missionary. And he just stood and looked at me for a few minutes. I said, do you have any hope for life hereafter? What is your hope? He said, I'm a Jack Mormon. And I said, a what? He said, a Jack Mormon. I said, what kind is that? So the one that swears and drinks coffee and smokes cigarettes. I said, well, honest confession is good for the soul. And uh, he said, um, He said, I want to ask you something. He said, I am told that the Mormon church is the only true church there is. He said, do you believe that? I said, when it comes to church, I guess it's as good as any of them. 
I only know one truth, and that's Jesus Christ. I said, I know he's true. Well, he said, I had a baby born the other night, still born. He said, I'm told that this baby, because it was still born, God never did breathe the breath of life into it, that I'll never see it again. He said, what do you think about that? Well, I said, you won't as a Jack Mormon. <laughs> you sure won't. That's one thing, sure. <laughs> you won't see it as long as you stay a Jack Mormon. And he said, uh, well, he had been pushing at me, so why not push him back a little bit to see if we had, had time to push back. <laughs> So he said, uh, he said, uh, I said, what's the matter? He said, oh, I don't know. And he said, uh, well, what do you think? I said, I am acquainted with many fine. I didn't know he was a Mormon. And I was a very, I know it being in Utah, it probably was. But I, because most of the people up there are Mormon around Salt Lake City. This wasn't Salt Lake City, however. So I thought, well, I've had some fine Mormon friends, been in the prayer lines, fine people. And I said, I have met some very fine men who are, are Mormons. And um he said, well, he said, uh, I said, I don't know their teaching on that. I wouldn't want to say something contrary to the, their teaching because that's what you are. And I respect that highly. And I said, well, uh, you believe that? He said, yes, sir, I do. But said, I don't live to it. I said, well, I believe that the Bible teaches that God knew that baby <laughs> uh, millions of years ago before the foundation of the world. I said, God told Jeremiah before you was ever conceived in your mother's womb, before you ever was uh, come forth from the belly, I knew you, sanctified you, and ordained you a prophet to the nations. I said, that's how much he knew about it. See? He said, well, he said, uh, thank you. He started walking down the hill, and then he met with this other fellow, and he said, why didn't you tell me that guy was a preacher? And so um, we, uh, he talked to him a little bit and began telling him about the meetings. Uh, Mormons believe prophecy. I don't, might not be any here, but they, but they do believe in, in prophecy. But so, uh, uh, maybe I'm talking out of school. Well, I, uh, uh, but however, they believe and he said, he come back to me and said, I understand that you are a prophet. I said, no, sir. I said, I, the Lord has showed me a few things to happen. And he took off right away. He said, let's go in. And he got in his car and went down to the, his little city from where he lived. In a few moments, he was missing. We was fixing the dogs to take another hunt right after lunch. And when we did, well, he took off in a car. In a few moments, a fine-looking young man come back about 17 years old, a real saintly-looking Christian gentleman. He said, this is my brother. He said, he is not a Jack Mormon. He's a real Mormon. I said, how do you do, son? And he said, I understand that my brother tells me that you are a prophet. I said, no, sir. I said, it isn't. I am a prophet. I said, the Lord has showed me things to come to pass. He said, I have a shot in my arm right now. I'm supposed to be on the operating table. He said, but my brother told me this. And I said, if that's so, I don't need the operation. He looked me right straight in the eye, an honest, true, sincere look. He said, you lay your hands upon me. If these things are so, I won't need the operation. He went home well. <laughs> This brother, Christian friend of mine, was hunting with me from Phoenix. He said to me, he said, some of these boys are sitting right here now. One of them I know is here, present. We went home. He said, Brother Branham, if the Lord would show you a vision and let you tell them Mormons just what's going to happen, that will do it because they are looking for it. <laughs> so I prayed and I prayed. And on my road back home, and I was coming up on the following Monday, Sunday, about 10 o'clock, I was standing in the room after church that morning and was Looking out, and I saw flashlights flashing, or some kind of a light flashing. And I saw a lion that was in a tree, and, and it was too small for me to shoot. I didn't want it. And there was someone else shot it, and when they did, they shot it with too big a gun. It blowed the lion up. I didn't appreciate the, the, the way it was done. When I got up to Phoenix, I told Brother Dawson that, and Brother Mosley, I know he's here. I see him the other day somewhere here. And... Um, he was going up with me. He and his wife and I said, you watch and see, that's thus saith the Lord. It's going to happen that way. Nights we waited, four or five nights we'd hunted our days. Seldom you ever tree a lion at night. Happened to be coming home, they turned the dogs loose, this hunter, this Mormon boy. And the, the lion struck a trail, or the dog struck the trail of the lion, rather than run him up in a tree. And at 10 o'clock at night, they come, got us out of bed. We went out there and there was that same lion in the tree. Flashing the lights. Brother Mosley shot him with about a forty-four caliber, like the blow line half and two. 
And there it was, just exactly the way it was said. The next day I met the chief game warden of the state, another Jack Mormon. Took those boys together, leading them back home to Christ. I tell you, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God proves his word to be so. You've heard people say, seeing is believing. That's not altogether true. Many people see and they still don't believe. The days that Jesus was on earth, why didn't they recognize him? That he was that word of God made manifest. Why didn't the people realize that Moses said, The Lord your God shall rise up a prophet like unto me. And he fulfilled every word that the Bible spoke that he had do. But they didn't believe it. But God in every age has proved his word to be true. He always proves his word. Then uh, they say sometimes that seeing is believing. It isn't so. But we know that God goes right on proving his word in every age. We know that he proved it to Adam and Eve that when he said, The day you eat thereof, that day you shall surely die. We have to admit to that, that that's truth. We believe that, for he's proved it to us. And we know that it's the truth. Now, we'll just take some places that God did prove his word. Let's take, for instance, in the days of, of Noah. God spoke to Noah a message that certainly was unscientific and unbelievable. No one could have believed it never rained upon the earth, unscientific. Perhaps they were a greater scientific age then than we are now because they built pyramids and sphinx and so forth in those days that we can't build now. They was acquainted with a power of some kind of a mechanical power, perhaps atomic or something, that they could lift those big boulders that we couldn't do it today. But they did great scientific things. They had a, something they could embalm a body to make it look natural for hundreds of years. We've lost that art. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And we know that we are to enter into another great scientific age. And now the message that Noah had was very much contrary to the belief of that day in the church. And it was also very much contrary to the scientific research. But God proved his word to be the truth. God proved that what that prophet said was the truth. Also, we'll take another for just a moment. Abraham was another prophet of the Lord that the word came to and told him when he was 75 years old and Sarah was 65 years old that he was going to have a child by Sarah. Now, that was quite a shock to an unbeliever. Could you imagine today such a thing happening even in this day with all of our scientific achievements and all these a test tube, babies they talk about and so forth. But this old woman now of 65 years old and an old man of 75 years old. But the word of the Lord came to Abraham and told him that this was going to happen. And Abraham believed God. Now, no matter how much God spoke and how true it was, Abraham had to believe what God said to make it so. Now, look how that man was tested with his testimony that he did believe. That same man that made that confession, that he believed God, he's a person like you are sitting here tonight. We still believe God. we got to believe his word is the truth. And he'll prove it that it's the truth if we'll just believe it. Now, look at the hindrance that Abraham had. First thing was his age, 75 years old. And Sarah being 65. She's way past the change of life, the menopause. No doubt, but what had stopped many years before, he'd lived with her as a wife. It was his half-sister. He'd probably take her when she was just a girl in her teens and had married her. And it uh, had no children. She was absolutely barren. And now we find that to do this, he had to separate himself from all of the peoples who did not believe it in order to make it come to pass. I don't mean to say you have to separate yourself from peoples, but you have to separate yourself from all the gossip of unbelief and stay away from that. When people say all those things don't happen, that's a bunch of lunatic people. There's no such a thing as that happening. Just close up your ears and walk away. Don't pay any attention to it. The Bible said that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, giving praise to God. His name was changed from Abram to Abraham. The changing of the name made his name Father of nations. Could you imagine a man living with his wife, his sweetheart, that 
He'd lived with her now for all these years, and now somewhere in the age of 80 years old, and his wife 70 years old, and yet without one child or any hope of child, yet claimed that he was a father of nations. Could you imagine the criticism of his passing fellow man would say, father of nations? Now, how many children do you have at this time? And all the criticism he had to go through with, but Abraham didn't stagger any word at all of unbelief. He believed that God was able to perform that which he had promised, that God would prove his word no matter how long it took. But instead of getting weaker each time, like we are prone to do, he got stronger all the time. If it didn't happen today, tomorrow it'll be a greater miracle because it's one day older. That was God. That was God in Abraham. For he know that God proved all of his words to be so if his children will only take his word so he can prove it by you. That's the only way he can prove his word. He doesn't prove it to unbelievers. They can't be proved. They're unbelievers. But it's not to unbelievers. It's not for unbelievers. It's to him that believe. And if he can find somebody who will believe his word, he'll prove his word by you. And sometimes sickness and things happen to us that way, that God can prove himself. Do you remember the blind man that Jesus found? They said, who sinned? He or his father, his mother? He said, in this case, neither. But that the works of God might be made known. See, it happened to the boy so that Jesus could be glorified. Sometimes sickness is not a curse. It's a blessing that we can stick our faith out there and call those things which are not as though they were. God said so, and he'll prove it so. If you're just not weakened under the test, he could prove Job one time that he wouldn't curse him to his face. Look at the trial that Job went through, but down in the very jaws of death, he yet said, the Lord gave the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He certainly believed it. God proved his word to Job. He proved it to Abraham. He proved it so. Also, he proved it by Moses. And when Moses, when the difficulty was so against him, Moses had it in his mind, perhaps to be a deliverer, that his mother had probably told him he was born a proper child. She, she was his tutor that raised him up in Pharaoh's palace. No doubt had told him, son, we have prayed that we be delivered, and we believe that you are that child that God will use to deliver. And then when he see you come up and was to be the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and we find out that he was to be heir to the throne, well, no doubt it was in their mind then that he would become the next Pharaoh, and that's how he would deliver the people, by being the next Pharaoh. But God had a, if that would have been so, then he would have done it through a material, through a, a, a act of politics. But God doesn't always work like that. God has his own ways to work. And he said he would bring them out. He told Abraham after 400 years, he would bring them out with a mighty hand. He'd show signs and wonders. So he couldn't do it like that. So Abraham, uh, we find out that Abraham believed God, and here's Moses now believing God. And Moses looked out the same window that Pharaoh did. He saw the same people that Pharaoh looked out upon them as a cursed people, a people that had nothing but a bunch of fanaticism for a god and some desert god somewhere that they know nothing about, some unseen post that they prayed to, that there was not nothing to it. They're a bunch of fanatics. And they were a bunch of slaves, and their God letting them be slaves proved that he wasn't God. And right in the midst of the whole thing, he was raising up the very man. God does things in such peculiar ways. Right up under him, not a theologian, not a teacher, not a priest, not one of their holy mans, but just an ordinary man, born for the job. And God called him to be his prophet and sent him down there, and nothing in his hand but a crooked stick. To face an army, mechanized units that had conquered the whole world. But with that stick in his hand, as God told him to hold that stick in his hand, and he would deliver Israel. And he went down and did it because God promised it. How's he going to do it? I will be with you. He said, show me your glory, Lord. I'm slow of speech. I can't talk right. And I, oh, he had a million excuses. But he said, I'll be with you. And that's all it took. He went taking God's word. No matter how dangerous the task seemed, it, Moses continued to believe God. And God proved his word through Moses to be the truth. Because regardless of what took place, Moses stayed right with the word. In the time of the journey, 
God told them down in Egypt also that he would deliver them into a promised land, a good land, full of milk and honey. It was absolutely there. They didn't know it was there. But he said, it's there, and I have given it to you. It's already yours. Just go claim it. And in the wilderness, when many of them come out, dancing in the Spirit, when Miriam beat the tambourine, eating manna out of heaven, listening to Moses sang in the Spirit, watching the miracles and signs go forth. But when he come to a showdown to believe the whole Word of God, all the promise, they failed. Only two of them believed it. That was Joshua and Caleb. And they brought back the evidence that the land was good, but the circumstances, was, that's what was what hindered them because they said, we're not able to take that land because their cities are walled, their, their, their delegates, not their delegates, but their, their people are, are great giants while we look like grasshoppers upside of them. Joshua and Caleb said, we're more than able to take it. Why? God had given it to them, no matter how big the giants was. The obstacle meant nothing to them. God had said so. And God proved it by them. And they did go over and take the land as God said they would do it. He proved it to them. Now, when they come up in the month of April, when the waters was flying down out of the mountains over the snow drifts and so forth, and it looked like it, God was a poor general to lead his army right up to a place he had them pinned off from the promised land. And the very time he'd taken them over, was going to take them over, it was the worst month in the year. The month that the Jordan was overflowing, his banks run plumb out into the fields. Well, if he's going to take them over, it'd be in the summertime when they could wade across. But he waited till the waters got deep. He likes to show that he's God. He likes to prove his word regardless. Don't care whether the doctor said you're dying with cancer, that's all the man knows. Maybe the waters are deep for some of you tonight, but remember, God made the promise. God keeps His Word and God proves His Word. It's the truth. He waited till the waters got muddy, until they got deep and over their heads and so forth, and then He opened up the way. He went before them and made the way. How are they going to get into Jericho when it was all closed over? Joshua was wondering. He knew God had led him that far. The next step belongs to God. One day when he was out walking around viewing the walls, he seen a man standing with his sword drawn. And he pulled his sword and went to meet the man. He said, Who are you for? Are you with us or are you for our enemy? He said, I am the captain of the host of the Lord. And he told him what to do. How is he going to blow a trumpet and a wall fall down that they could run a chariot race across it? What would have anything to do with the trumpet? God uses such simple methods. It's so the simplicity of it, what makes it God to me? We're always trying to find some great something's going to do something. And God, some great organization's going to take the whole thing and clear it all out. When God takes a simple person, just one man that he can hold in his hands and he'll prove every word that he said by it. He takes such simple little methods. Sound a trumpet, not... Uh, dig out the wall, but just sound a trumpet and the walls will fall down. The blast of the trumpet will knock the walls down. How foolish to the carnal mind. But God proved His Word was true. For the walls fell down, one on top of the other. They went straight up and they uh, took the city. Oh, God likes to prove Himself to be God. Joshua knew that one day, and when he was standing there, one of the greatest paradoxes that ever happened, outside of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when the enemy had routed them and the different armies was in the mountains, he had them routed and the sun was going down. Oh, my, what a time it was for General Joshua. Remember, he fought that land through without having a hospital, a nurse, a first aid band, or he had a wounded man. <laughs> Tell me something that can beat that. <laughs> yes, sir. He never had no hospitals, no nurses, and he never lost any man as long as they walked in the will and word of the Lord. God proved that he was with them. Right. Notice now, and we find out that Joshua knew if night come, they slip around and get with one another and, and, and get themselves together and make another big army and he'd have a rough time with them the next day. He didn't know what to do. So he looked up to God. He needed help. And he needed that sun to stand still. So he just commanded that sun to stand still and the, said for the moon to hang over Agilon. Not move until he commanded it. 
And the moon and sun stayed still for 24 hours when Joshua fought the battle and conquered the enemy because he was right in the line of duty. He had a right to do it because he was obeying God's commandment. And as long as you're in the line of duty, keeping God's word, doing just what he told you to do, marching by the orders of God, you've got a right to say to that mountain, be moved. God keeps his word. If you say to this mountain, be moved, don't doubt in your heart, but believe that that what you've said will come to pass. You can have that what you have said. Jesus said that in St. Mark eleven twenty two. That's the truth. I know that's the truth. It's God's word and that proves that it's the truth. We're just afraid sometimes. We get to a place we're afraid he won't keep that word. He will keep that word. He said he would do it. Now we find that's true. He proved it. Isaiah's prophecy one time, which uh, something had never happened, never did before and never has since. He said, a virgin shall conceive. Could you imagine a woman without knowing a man would have a child? Isaiah said, a virgin shall conceive. And God caused a virgin to conceive to prove his word truth. He proved his word because the virgin did conceive. And she brought forth the son. Now... That word made flesh. Look what it did. When that son came forth, he was the word himself. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was that living word. He proved he was that living word. He said to those teachers of that day, Who can condemn me of sin? Sin is unbelief. Who can tell me that I'm an unbeliever? Every word that's written to me has been fulfilled. The last seven predictions of his life was fulfilled in the last seven hours on the cross. Everything was written of him was fulfilled because he was the word. He proved he were, was. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. He proved he was the word. Notice this case here at Jairus' house. He, was t- he had told them the truth. We see him as he crossed the sea. He comes in. There was a little woman up on the hill that had spent all of her money with the physicians. No doubt the physicians had done all they know how to do to get the woman well. Probably Hebrew physicians, and that was a Hebrew woman. So they had done all they could for their sister. Although they had nothing to stop this uh, blood issue, which is perhaps a menopause time, and her blood had flowed forth till she, little thing is so weak, she could hardly get around anymore. And she had heard about Jesus. And when she seen the little boat push into the willows, she went down to find out. A lot of his critics were standing there. And he's not free of critics today. If they'd have known who he was, they would not have been his critics. But they was his critics because they didn't know who he was. And that's the way with the message today. So many good men and women criticize this because they don't know what it is. Jesus said, if you'd have known Moses, you'd have known me. Moses spoke of me. Many great men long to see this day. If I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. I have greater witness, he said, in that of John. For the works that I do prove that the Father is with me. He had greater works because he was the identified. John was identified also as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But when he come... He was a prophet that Moses had spoke of and be raised up. As I said the other night, he come in three names. The name of the Son of God, Son of Man, and Son of David. When he was on earth here the first time, he was the Son of Man. He could not be Son of God then. He never claimed to be. He said he was Son of Man. When anybody would question him, he said, you see the Son of Man, the Son of Man. Now, Son of Man is a prophet. He had to come that way because the Scripture, he cannot come contrary to the Scripture. That's why today our our message of this hour cannot come through theologians and theology. It's got to come back to the same thing it promised to do. It must be that way. So we find that in this man, he had to be a prophet, not son of God there. He had to be son of man. Jehovah himself called the prophets Jeremiah and son of man. When you see the Son of Man, who is the Son of Man? They kept asking. Then he served his office as Son of Man. Then he served his office now as Son of God. God is a spirit. And when now he served through the church ages, 
as son of God. Now, in the millennium, he'll be son of David. When he sits on the throne of David, he'll be the heir to the throne, son of David. Son of man, son of God, son of David, and it's the same man all the time. Just like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The office of God, he was God the Father. Then he became God the Son. Now he's God the Holy Ghost. Not three gods, one God, three manifestations, three attributes of the same God. Now, we find it in this hour that we're now living. God keeps his word just the same as he did then. We find out that he come across the sea. This woman believed him. There's something within her begin to pound. She had no scripture for it. No more scripture than Joshua had to stop the sun. But she believed in her heart that he was the son of God. So she said, if I can only touch his garment, I will be healed. So she pressed through the crowd until she touched his garment and the blood issue stopped. Now, he looked up on the audience to find out who touched him. No doubt there was someone. He stopped all the people thronging him and some making fun of him, some laughing at him, the priest standing off and questioning him and the clergyman and so forth. But there were some who believed him. And, and after a while, he stopped. All of a sudden, turned around and said, who touched me? Some of them said, why, well, Master, I believe it was Peter, said, why, well, the whole crowd is thronging you. Why, well, who touched you? Well, everybody's touched. He said, but I perceive that virtue has gone from me. He got weak. It was a different kind of touch. If we can only see that, brother, sister. If you can touch him with that certain touch. Oh, sick people, I'm fixing to pray for you just in a few minutes. I do believe that I have the Holy Spirit. No more Holy Spirit than what you've got right out there, these men's got here. The same Holy Spirit. But it's a commandment of God. And if you believe that to be the commandment of God, of praying for the sick and laying hands on them and casting out evil spirits and the promises that he's made, it'll be the same thing with you. You'll get what you ask for if you can believe it. Canst thou believe that I'm able to do this, said Jesus? Yea, Lord, I believe, said the man with the child with the epilepsy. I believe that thou art the Son of God that was to come into the world. Now, we know that that can only take that attitude to bring the results. Now, quickly, let's think of him a moment. Here he's on his road up. A little priest came down. No doubt that that little fellow was a borderline believer. There's so many of them in the world today. Little borderline believers. They want to believe that. They want to believe that the Holy Ghost is real. They want to believe this is an apostolic move, as God promised in the last days he'd pour out his spirit. We, we want to believe in Malachi 4, that he promised that in the last days of the original Pentecostal faith would be restored back to the, to the church again. Malachi 4 claims it. Behold, I will send to you Elijah in the last day. It's right. And he will restore the faith of the children back to the fathers again. See? The faith of the fathers to the children also. See, it's got to be... You say, well, that was John the Baptist. No, no. John the Baptist in Malachi 3. That's right. Matthew 11 says so. If you can receive it, this is he who spoke of. Behold, I send my messenger before my face. It was Elijah. Certainly Jesus said it was, but not the Elijah of Malachi 4 at all. Because immediately after that message, the earth is to be burnt with fire and the righteous walk out upon the ashes of the wicked. So it never happened in the time of John. We've got to have a message sweep back and bring the people out of all these denominational conditions back to the original genuine Pentecostal faith. And we're seeing it done. It's fulfilling of a scripture that has to come to pass. All scriptures must be fulfilled. How many more of that we could apply? It would take me longer in my time up now to show. But you understand these things that it's got to happen just exactly like this to Abraham's children. Just as he promised. We see Jesus going up now uh, to heal the little girl because the father, the little borderline believer, uh, something come to a spot that he had to recognize Jesus. So the doctor had given her up and he got on his little black hat and took off down to find out whether he could find Jesus. See, he's always right there when you want him. He found him just coming into the shore. And he said, uh, come to my little girl, lay your hands upon her and she will be made well. said, she's laying at the point of death. She's my only child said she's 12 years of age. We don't have no other children. Wife and I perhaps are getting old. And this is the only child that we have. And she's laying at the point of death. Lord, I believe you. If you'll just come lay your hands upon her, she'll get well. 
See, what did he recognize? He recognized that that promised word of God was manifested in this man, just the same as Nicodemus said, uh, uh, Rabbi, teacher, we know thou art a teacher comes from God. We know it. The Pharisees know it. Why didn't they confess it? No man could do the things that you do unless God was with him. We know that you come from God. Uh, here we find out that Jeremiah believed the same thing. He said, uh, come lay your hand. He know that God was in him. Lay your hands upon my child. Though she's at the point of death, she'll live. He just walked on with him. And while he was going, here come a runner coming back and said, don't trouble him. Don't trouble the master any farther. Uh, the girl dead. She's gone on now. She's passed on. Jesus turned to her. I said, didn't I say to you, if you'd only believe, you'll see the glory of God? If you just only believe it? He got into the room, and there there was all lamenting and crying and wailing, just like any person's would do. A fine little girl, a pastor's daughter, had died, and she was taken out of this world. And she'd probably been dead for hours. And then they laid her out on the couch and was uh, ready to embalm her body, perhaps, and put her away and, um, in burial. Then we find that Jesus walked in the houses all wailing. He says, give, give peace. He said, she is not dead. But she's asleep. Now, could you imagine uh, what they thought? Well, this man we know now, we understand that he's an uh, illegitimate child. And we uh, hear of his, all of his uh, rational predictions that he makes. And now we know that the priest is right. The man's crazy. For we know that she's dead. The doctor pronounced her dead. And there she lay. She's gone. And we know she's dead. They said they laughed him to scorn. In other words, made him feel embarrassed uh, by criticizing him. But he had done said that she wasn't dead. That's all it takes. She's asleep. No matter how much critics, he's going to prove his word. He put them all out of the house, get all the unbelievers away. Tuck Peter, James, and John, the believers, three witnesses, and the father and mother, went in and took the daughter by the hand and spoke in a language that called her soul back from somewhere out in eternity. And the girl lived. What did he do? He proved his word. He proved that what he said, she was not dead. She was asleep. Now, we find out doing this, realizing that he proved something else there. Uh, he proved that he was God. He proved that he had foreknowledge. Watch what his word said now. She is not dead, but she is asleep. See? She wasn't dead to begin with. She was asleep. Showed his foreknowledge. Now, there might have been a many a little maiden died that same morning. But this one wasn't dead. <laughs> she was asleep. Like Lazarus was. And he called her out of that sleep because she wasn't dead. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and liveth in me shall never die. Only those who are on the Lamb's book of life that he redeemed when he died, that's who he'll call out of that sleep at that day. Those who are quickened by his power that has that quickening power laying in them, even as I said last night, even after Elisha had died and his bones was laying in the grave, that quickening power was still on his bones. Sure, he proved that who he was. Now, we find out again, likewise, he proved also that in Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, he proved he was the Word of God. He certainly did. Notice what he did. Hebrews 12, uh, Hebrews 4, 12 says that the word of God is more powerful, quicker than a two-edged sword, and, and uh, it also is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Watch just a moment now. When he first started his ministry, after he come out to show that he was the word, when he come out of the wilderness from his temptation, there was a man named Peter. His name then was Simon. And he came to Jesus with his brother Andrew. And as soon as he walked up into the presence of Jesus Christ, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, and your father's was Jonas. From henceforth you shall be called Peter. 
That proved that he was the Word, because the Word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He was the Word. Philip, seeing this happen, he took off around the mountain, was gone a day and come back, and he brought with him a friend named Nathaniel. He said, these things are really happening. Moses said that, Lord, our God shall raise up a prophet like him. Here the man is. Why, he told Simon who he was, even who his father was. And we know that what he says is the truth because God said it in the word and here it is proved. That he was to do that, and that proves that that is the Messiah. And when he walked up in his presence, Jesus said to him, said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. He proved his word. He proved God's word. He did. The woman at the well, when she had... Uh, well, he asked her to let him have a drink of water from the pitcher that she was drawing water from the well. And she said, it's not customary for you Jews to ask uh, we Samaritan women and such a thing as that because we have no dealing. He said, but if you knew who you were speaking with, uh, you'd ask me for a drink. She said, the well's deep. And the conversation, as it moved on, finally he found out what her trouble was. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, Thou hast said truth, for you've had five, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Why, she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She, we hadn't had one for 400 years, you know. He said, Well, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, we know that when the Messiah cometh, which is called the Christ, when he comes, he will tell us these kind of things. That'll be his sign. When he, he said, I'm he that speaks with you. He proved his word. He, we proved what he claimed to be. He was the Messiah, the Son of God. Now we find out also that this little woman that had this blood issue that touched his garment, that also proved to her that he was the word of God. Now remember, tonight Jesus said also in Hebrews uh, 1, uh, Hebrews the third chapter, I believe it is, he said, that he now is a high priest, this age we're living in now, a high priest sitting in the majesty of God in the heavens that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Hebrews 13, 8 said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God that he was then. He's the same tonight. St. John fourteen twelve he said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Even more than this shall he do, for I go to my Father. See? He that believeth on me, these works that I do, shall he do also. In Matthew 28, he said, A little while in the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you even to the end of the world. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He stands tonight to prove his word. My time is gone. But he proved, he, could, he proved his word then what he had promised for that day. He proved Isaiah's words. He proved Noah's words. He proved Moses' words. He proved every one of the prophets' words. He promised in this day, the day that we're living in, that the world would be in a Sodom condition. Homosexuals. Just look at it in the world today. All over the world where I travel, not only here, everywhere. It's critical. In Sweden, young men and women go skiing, start naked. And uh, they, in Germany, and in France, and everywhere else, it's just about kind of a riffraff that we have here in the United States. It's an age, I, if I get a chance to ever come back, I'd like to speak on some of the prophetic things to you. To show you that the age that we're living in, the Bible said that children would rule their parents. Word. But remember, Abraham had a seed, which was the seed Isaac. He had other seeds after Sarah's death, and he was 145 years old. He married another woman, had seven sons besides daughters, because God had turned him back to a young man when he was 100 years old. He's then again just 45. So then he, we know that. I preached that to you here in California years ago. And now we understand that Abraham's seed 
was not the literal sexual seed through Sarah, which was Isaac, which made a nation, but the royal seed was by the promise, which was Jesus Christ. And through that seed, he raised up a royal seed. Oh, well, now we are royal priesthood, a royal nation, a holy nation, offering praises to God, the sacrifice of our lips, giving praise to his name. God proved his word. He poured out the Holy Ghost upon us. He said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the day when the Son of Man will be revealed. Now, did you notice from Son of God, just before he becomes Son of David, he reveals himself again as Son of Man. Did you notice the Scripture? For he always does. He never does nothing unless he makes it known to his servants, the prophets. Exactly. That's what his promise was, see. He never does nothing. God cannot lie. He always reveals it first before he does it. Look at the situation we're setting in today. Look where we're at. Every one of you will admit we're in a modern Sodom. You know this country's in for it. There's beyond hopes. There's no salvation left for this nation or no other nation. We're beyond that now. The prophecies that's prophesied about this is fulfilled. God's a gleaning, getting that last little sheep wherever it is. It'll all be in one day. We're at the end time. Look positionally. I asked you, just as a brother or sister, to build just a moment more faith before we pray for these people. And I know we don't have to go at no certain time, but I, I, I want to start the prayer line, and you have to go, may go then. See, you want to stay in the prayer line, may stay. But just let me just, as a brother, sh- just point out something to you a moment. Watch Jesus in Luke 17, 30. See, when he was saying there about the end time, how they would be like in days of Noah, and then said, and likewise in the days of Sodom, said, when the Son of Man is being revealed. The Son of Man again. Not Son of God. Son of Man. See, that brings in Malachi 4 again, right straight back. All these other prophecies coming right in, how it's supposed to be done. He proves his word to be so. That's right. And notice, in doing so, how he's going to pour out his Spirit upon all flesh and what's going to take place. How the restoration will come back and their sons and daughters shall prophesy. Upon my hands, maids and maidservants, will I pour out of my Spirit and I'll show signs in the heavens above. I got a picture here of Brother Lee Bale. Sure, I'd like to show you just what taken place up on the mountain the other day when all the school kids turned out just before this great subject of the open them seven seals. When the school kids turned out, was up in there praying here as far just in a funnel coming down. They go back up and burst out and turn around, come back down again. That's what he said. What to go tell the people? We, there it is for the schools of Tucson and where it went up into the air and signs stuck to pictures and so forth and questioned about it. They said, where is it at? What happened? They can't make it out. See? Oh, it's not done in a corner. Only dark in conscience. It never, Jesus, when he was here, there's millions of people who never knew he was on earth. Yeah. There'll be millions today, won't understand. Tens of millions of them. But there will be to those who it's sent to, they will understand. The wise shall know their God in that day and they'll do exploits. We realize that the hour that we're now living. Look at Sodom now. Look what happened. He said, as it was in the days of Sodom, there was a group of people that was looking for a promised son. We believe that? That was Abraham and his group. There was a lukewarm bunch, lop, half backslid, yet a believer, down in Sodom. Three classes of people. There's always them three classes. Ham, Sham, Japheth's people, also believers, make believers and unbelievers. They're everywhere. We find them in every group, everywhere you find them. And that group is still here. You have to divide that. You can take it right through the scripture. Just dovetails itself right in. Listen to this. Look at where we're sitting positionally and prophetically tonight. Now, every one of us know that the world's in a sodomite condition. We know all the prophecies of Israel is in its homeland. If you want to know nationally where we are standing, watch Israel, where it's at. If you want to know what condition the church is, watch the way women act. She's the church. See her immoral, indecent. Watch, look where the church is at. Just watch it, see. Just watch women. You see where, how your women degrade and become so uh, polluted. That's where your church is. See, the time. Watch where Israel is. You see the time figure where we're at. See, Just watch those signs and wonders. If, you, if, you, or if your eyes is open, see where we're at. Now watch positionally where we're setting. The world in a Sodom condition. 
Now notice, as it was, now notice there was somebody in that day watching for a coming promised son, Abraham and Sarah. They were watching for a promised son in Abraham's group. They was not in Sodom. But just at the moment, the last uh, chapter of the event, just before the promised son came, there were three men came down from heaven. An angel, two angels, and God. And they came down <clears throat> and talked with Abraham under the oak. Is that right? And two of them went down into Sodom and cried out against the sins of the city. And it's just before the burning of the Gentile world at that time. All Sodom perished right then. Just a, a few was pulled out. Lot and his two daughters. His wife never even made it. She turned back. How I could just like to have time to show you that right now, where that church is standing at that position. I want you to notice. Now, in one man stayed behind that had talked to Abraham, and he done a sign to Abraham. And watch, Abraham had seen God in many great signs. We believe that, don't we? Just before the coming sun, but before the sun was manifested, there was a sign he was given because the son, the true son, was to be the son of God through Abraham's faith. See? was Jesus. We being Abraham's seed, dead in Christ, we are Abraham's seed. Notice. Now, just before that taken place, this son to come, there this one has stayed and talked to Abraham, had his back turned to the tent, and he said, Abraham, now just the day before that, he was Abram. Now I said, Abraham, where is thy wife Sarah? Not Sarah, S-A-R-R-A-S-A-R-A-H, princess. Where is thy wife Sarah? Said, she's in the tent behind you. He said, I'm going to visit you. See, according to my promise that I made you. In other words, the time of life, Sarah will start in her ordinary time of life again. And Sarah, being old, a hundred years old now, in the tent, laughed up her sleeve. See, she smiled to herself, said, how could that man be right? See, me an old woman, my Lord Abraham, out there also, oh, family affair had been done away with for years. Said, how can I ever have pleasure again with my Lord? He being old and me old, past bearing, milk veins gone, ever, she's dried up. How could we ever have pleasure again? And that man with his back turned to the tent said, why did Sarah laugh saying, how can these things be? What was that? Discernment. A prophetic, see? See, that's what he's seen. Now, he said, that will return again. And the Son of Man, which that was, that was the Son of Man right there. Well, he called him Elohim. <laughs> Lord God, Elohim. Anybody knows that's right. Elohim is the Lord God. In the beginning, Elohim created heavens and earth. The all-sufficient one. The Son of Man made flesh. There he was standing there in flesh at that time like a theophany, standing there discerning what Sarah was saying in the tent behind him. He promised, watch, the royal seed of Abraham has promised to see that same thing. But notice, Lot, he had a messenger down there too. Two of them went down there. One of them went down, another went out with him, and they preached and called the people to flee from the wrath that was to come. Positionally, the world has never set in that estate from that day that Jesus made the promise until right now. I want to ask any historian that might be in the building, or if you're even on this tape and hear it at any time, please write me. I've studied history now for some 30 years, of the Bible history. And there never has been a person that I've ever seen in all the history of the church through the seven church ages that we're now in Lady Osea, and we know that. Never has there been a messenger that ever went to the entire church with his name ending with H-A-M till now. G-R-A-H-A-M. Billy Graham. There's been Moody, Finney, Sankey, Knox, <laughs> Luther, and so forth, but never a H-A-M, Father to Nations. Now, remember, he's G-R-A-H-A-M, six letters, but A-B-R-A-H-A-M is seven letters. Notice they're down there, Billy Graham, going into the, the outer parts of the world and calling out of Sodom. Come out. Flee the wrath that's to come. There's no man that I know of in the field has got a hope of God on that word of justification like Billy Graham does. He can present it. He's not such a theologian. I guess he's a theologian, but he's not such a powerful teacher. But God is with him. 
that man will stand there with like a Sunday school lesson, whole host people spellbound. He's God's servant of the hour. To who? The church natural. It's in Sodom. But remember, there was one church spiritual that wasn't in that denominational outfit either, in a called out group. And they received a message also in a messenger. And what was it? Discerning the thoughts that was in the heart. God always proves his word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this crucial moment where decisions must be made, time is ticking on by. We don't know what hour our Lord may come. As we see these prophecies that's been made by him through your prophets down through the ages is now being unfolded. Oh, God, how I thank you for this, that even able-bodied man, able man and, and theology that can stand up against the wiles of the world and the unbelievers and all these panels and beyond a shadow of doubt, stand there bold and gallant, knowing where they're standing and prove that word to be true by the Scriptures. And then we who are waiting on your coming, Lord, believing these other things that's been prophesied that would take place, to stand in the joy, seeing you walk right among us and perform the very thing that you said would come to pass, proving your word to be right. Eternal God, your sick children are sitting here. I don't know how much more time we've got to work. The evening sun is sinking, but you promised to the prophet, it shall be light about the evening time. We see the same sun rises in the east as the one that sets in the west. Civilization has traveled with the sun, and now we're at the west coast. And the gospel traveled with civilization. Now, Father, we know this is the end of the gospel, the end of time, the end of the age. She's fading into eternity, but you promised that the sun would come out. The Son of Man would be revealed. In the last days, this would take place. The evening lights have come, Father. We thank thee for that. Humbly as it is, yet you do it so simple many times that it goes way over the top of the great so-called deep thinkers and reveals it to babes such as will learn. I pray, God, that you'll make it so tonight that your poor sick children here will see the promise of God and each one of them will be healed and go out of here tomorrow with new strong bodies and be well again, granted, Lord, so that they can take the message from one to the other to that last one is in the fold, and then the doors will be shut. Help us, dear God. I ask you tonight, in the face of all this, if you'll just once more, Father, for me. It, it seemed the other night, uh, people never noticed it much, but I pray, let it happen again tonight, Lord, because I have went over my allotted time to speak, but I, I don't know how much longer we're going to have to do this. So I pray, Father, will you hear me? And hear the prayer of these godly men and women that's sitting here tonight who's filled with your spirit. They are believers, Lord. You can just work among them. And we, I pray that you'll confirm your word. And she said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Let it be again, Jesus, to prove that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. I ask it for the glory of God in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I just for a moment, I want to know how many people in here that have prayer cards. I, I want you to raise your hands. Each one of you has prayer cards. Well, it's generally, I guess it's about all over. I wonder how many people in here does not have prayer cards and yet you're sick. Would you raise your hands and say, I do not have a prayer card and yet I am sick. I am needy. I want to ask you to be reverent for a moment. <clears throat> now, I love to talk to you. That's always my trouble. I talk too long. But before you come, I, I hope and trust that God will prove this, that what I've said to be the truth. And let, let him just see. Now, how many sitting out there that's sick, that knows that I don't know one thing about you, raise up your hands. Just so you know. All right. I want you without the prayer cards now, the prayer cards will be called up. I want you to pray. The Bible said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever. He says he's a high priest, sitting there making intercessions upon our confession. 
We have to confess it first before he can be a high priest, because he only intercedes to our confession. Is that right, minister? Brother? Amen. He only intercedes upon our confession. What we confess that he is, what he has done for us. Not what he will do, he's already done it. We have to confess that he's done it. He was wounded for our transgressions, with his stripes we were healed. Now, the Heavenly Father knows that looking upon you is to see, I uh, recognize a good friend of mine from Ohio, him and his wife sitting here as uh, Mr. Dow and his wife. And I believe sitting second or third from him is again that Reverend Mr. Blair that I seen last night. It's dark over the audience to me, kind of these lights here is uh, kind of a little blary to me and I, I don't see you too well, but I want you to pray and you put on your heart the thing that you have need of, and you asked our high priest who can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Now, me not knowing you, and you might just touch me all over, be like touching your brother, your husband, your pastor, someone, it would, it would do no good. But if you touch him, and if we are truly in line with his spirit, then he can use your faith to touch him and my gift to speak back through. See, I'd be just as mute as this... This is here without a voice speaking through it. This, got to, this, this is a mute without something here to speak through it. And so is any person is a mute when it comes to these things unless God speaks through them. Now you pray and let's see if these things that I have said is the truth. God help it to be so. I don't say that he will. I hope that he will. I'm trusting that he will. He's never let me down yet or the... Years of crossing around the world with all kinds of nations and millions of people, he's never failed me yet. And I'm sure, just as sure as I believe I'm standing here, he won't fail me now. I'm going to ask you just to be reverent and keep seated just for a few moments. We're going to dismiss the main audience and pray for the sick just in a moment. But I want you, you believers, that if you'll just not look to me but believe, say, I believe that what the man said is the scripture. I don't know as we're as far up in the time as he says we are, but if it is, then it's got to happen. If his words are God's words, then his words will fail, but God's words won't. God's obligated to back up his word. He'll prove it. He'll prove it. He that believeth on me. He proved that this is the last day. He proved what would happen. He proved that this was supposed to happen. And remember, Abraham... And his group never received one more sign from God until the promised son arrived. How many knows that's true? That sign of discernment. And the royal seed of Abraham, let me hear you, let me tell you, thus saith the Lord, you're receiving your last sign. That's according to the scriptures. And the revelation of God that's in my heart that speaks that this is the truth. And I trust that you will believe it to be the truth. Now, you believe. Everybody just believe. Say, Lord Jesus, let me touch you. I have a need in my heart. And I know Brother Branham knows nothing about me. I don't even know the man. He don't know me. But you know. And if he's told me the truth, this will happen. I ask you, don't move now just for a little bit. Be real. See your spirit. And I take every spirit in here under my control in the name of Jesus Christ that his word might be fulfilled. Now, just be reverent. Pray. Look to him. Say, Lord, I believe it. Help thou my unbelief. Let's start. I have to concentrate on some sort of the part of the building here. Because there's so many of you, and each one of you is a spirit. I cannot. You say, what about me? I could not tell you. It's sovereign. All the works of God is sovereign. There'll be many people healed crossing this platform tonight. There'll probably be many not. It's all in the sovereign of God. Who can tell him what to do? No one. He works according to his own will, his own plan. But you just believe. Be humble. Don't be nervous. Just reach out for God and say, Lord God, I believe it. See? Let me touch your garment. I have need of such and such. I know the brother don't know me or know my need. But he told us that, uh, about these things that you did and say that you're here the same today. That don't exclude you, brother, you're on the platform. Any of you. I just ask you, my brother as fellow workers of the, of the gospel of Christ. I speak to you just as sincerely as I know as a, a dying man with you. See? Leaving this world, we've got to leave. And I must give an account at the day of judgment for what I say. I'm conscious of that. Very conscious. And I appreciate you, man. What you are standing here with me, helping me. I'm trying to help you to do everything I can.
for the kingdom of God's sake. I'm praying and asking. Here. How many ever seen that light in the picture? You've seen the picture of it? There, it hangs right there. Can't you see it? It's up over that lady sitting there with her handkerchief. She's praying for a, a loved one. That's right, lady. That loved one, do you believe me to be his prophet, or uh, pardon me, his servant? You believe that? All right. Now, if God can reveal to me what's wrong, why, well, you will accept it to be from God, just as the woman that touched his garment. Now, you know you're, you're 20 or 30 feet from me or more. You never touch me, but you've touched something that you know you're in contact with something, someone. What it is, it's for a woman, which is your daughter. That's right. You believe that she'll be made well? She is an, a dope addict. That is exactly right. A serious swimming drunk. She, now the handkerchief that you have in your hand, you place upon her and don't doubt. I believe that God will deliver. Will you believe it with me? Amen. Now, I don't know the woman. But God knows her. You believe now? With all your heart? The man sitting up there with the striped shirt on with a hernia, you believe that God would heal you and make you well? You believe it? he will do it? I've never seen the man in my life. You have a prayer card, sir? You don't, have, you don't need one. Mm. If thou canst believe. Here sits a woman trying to look over the top of this woman sitting right here. She's a stranger to me, but she's real nervous. I don't know her. I've never seen her in my life. But God knows her. And she realizes right now she's in contact with something. You've been praying there for some cause. The reason that you are, you can't stay no longer tonight. You must leave the meeting. You're planning on going to your home tomorrow. You're not from here, or neither you're from California. You're going east from here. You're going by air. You're planning going by air. You're from Oklahoma. That's right. You're also in a dying condition. You come here to be prayed for. You do not have a prayer card. But you believe that you're going to be healed if you could only get here. That's right. Also, your condition is cancer. The cancer is in the bone. Do you believe you're going to be healed now? you believe you're in contact with him, my sister? Perhaps God will tell me who you are. Then would that help you? If it is, raise up your hand. If you believe that God, it would help you. All right, Mrs. Steele. You can return to Oklahoma. I don't know the lady. I have never seen her. Here's a lady sitting right back here behind her. She is suffering with varicose veins. And she's also got a son that's an alcoholic. And she's praying for him. She'll believe she can be healed. Mrs. Mason, will you believe with all your heart and believe that Jesus Christ will grant the healing to you? Uh, you do? All right. Then lay your hand on that lady sitting next to you there. She is praying for her husband that's unsaved. God will grant the healing. Let us pray. Dear God, I pray that you'll grant that blessing to her. Give that woman to the desire of her heart, Lord. Her faith is so close to you, it's touched you. I pray, Father, that you'll help. In Jesus' name, amen. Now believe with all your heart that you receive it. Will you do that? God bless you. You believe your husband's going to be saved, lady? You believe with all your heart? Raise up your hand. You do.
There seems to be before me a, a woman that's very heavy. Here she sits. <clears throat> you believe me to be God's servant? You believe me to be God's servant? You do, all right. I do not know you. What your trouble is, is glands. You're overweight. You've been to a doctor. He said he could do nothing about it. But that was an earthly doctor. You're, you've just had a lot of sorrow. You've lost your husband. You're not from here. You're really from Arkansas. You're seeking work also, and you can't find work. He was afraid that something you wouldn't get called. But your faith now has touched God. My sister, you go believe. God give you a job. Give you the desire of your heart. God proves his word to be true. You believe that to be so? Now, I just want you to pray with me again. Father God, you are the same God that proved when you said that girl is not dead, she's asleep. Then you had to prove it. Now, you promised that just before the coming of the end time that the Son of Man would reveal himself in the same manner he did at Sodom. You promised it, Lord. Now, you've come to the earth in the form of the Holy Spirit and got among us tonight. We believe in people and have proved it. You've proved your word like you did that day. Lord, we need no more proof. You're among us. We love you. And we realize that this is the last sign just before you're coming, according to the scriptures. And all the shadows and types never fail. They've got to be positive. So we pray, Father, that as your children come now to be prayed for, that every one will be healed. May there not be a sick person left among us at the end of this healing service. Oh, dear God, will you let your anointing be so graciously upon your people just now? That every one of them may be healed. And if there be some here who is not your children yet, and up on the basis of these things that they have heard the word and seen the thing done just exactly proved to the very letter of who you are and what you are, that you're here, and Lord, would you, would you bless a lie? Well, certainly not, Lord, but you did promise to bless your word. And it would not return void. It would accomplish that which it was purposed for. And now you have did that before us tonight beyond any shadow of doubt. And with our heads bowed, is there people here that never have believed before that would like to just raise up your hand with your head bowed, just raise up your hand and stand to your feet and say, I now believe with all my heart and I want to accept Jesus Christ right now. Would you do that? Any people, any people that's here that hasn't yet accepted Christ and would want to do it at this time. I won't tell you, you go to the church of your choice, but I'm asking you to receive Jesus Christ while you, you'll probably never be no closer to him until you see him in person when he comes in his visible body from the heavens. Will you now accept him if you haven't already done it? Upon a basis of seeing no one here standing, I believe then all of you to be sane, sensible people and realizing what you're doing. If you're sitting there under this, you remember, if you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. There was somebody standing up, maybe S in the audience, in the back. Dear God, those may I not see that's standing. They want to accept you. They realize, Lord, that this has not been done until this time. And now you confirm it and prove that it's so. I pray, Father, that in their hearts that strangely moved at this time, how do we know but what this is the last person to come in? This may be the end for Los Angeles. This may be the last soul that will be born into the kingdom. We don't know when that time comes. And when it does, the door will be closed. The body will be complete. It will not be a freak body or a freak bride. It will just have so many members whose names were put on the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world to which Jesus came to take like Adam, walk right out to save his wife. I pray, God, that you'll receive them now into your kingdom. They're in your hands. Deal with them, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each one of you that stood. I didn't know some of you were standing. Some stood in the back, some up in the balcony. Now, I want you to do one thing for me. Please understand me. Meet some minister here and talk it over with them after the church. 
is over. Will you do that? Don't let it fail. If you've never been baptized in Christian baptism, do that next. And then stay with your hands up until you receive the Holy Ghost. Now, the many people has prayer cards here. We're going to ask them to stand and come up here. And I guess walk across or shall I have to come? I'll not be able to. From this side over here. Can come out through this way. Over on this side. The people who have prayer cards. And now, if there's any of you that must go, it's I'm late. I'm sorry. I'll try to do a little better tomorrow night. At It's 10 minutes after 10 by the clock on the wall. Thank you very much for your attendance tonight, and may the God of heaven bless you. If you'd like to stay and watch the prayer line, you're always welcome. But we're going to start praying for the sick now, and I don't want to hold you unless you want to stay. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus. May God's peace go with you and bless you and give you rest in your bodies through the night and grant you good health so you can come back again tomorrow night. God be with you now, and let those who have prayer cards stand for a prayer. Now, as universally we pray for the people. Now, we want you to know, now you are standing with the prayer cards. Is there any doubt in your life? Is there any, pardon me, any sin in your life that you haven't confessed? If there is, let me ask you this. Don't come into the prayer line with unconfessed sin in your heart. Because you must, this is the children's bread, see? And if you're not a Christian... Surrender your life to Christ in the prayer line, then come. It's for the believer. Will you do it? Accept him first as your Savior, and then come across the platform to be prayed for. I'm going to pray for each individual, not just passing by, like some kind of a routine. We're in a church now. I think Sister White has given us the reason that we can stay and pray. We can stay as long as we want to. And uh, I thank Sister White and the staff here for letting us do that. God bless her. Her gallant husband stood on this platform, prayed for sick until he died, as far as I know. A real soldier of the cross. And now uh, I'm trying to keep on uh, doing the same thing. Bless this people. And now I pray that each one of you comes to pass here. You don't have to confess anything that you want to. You don't have to say anything wrong with you. Just come and let me pray for you. And believe, do you believe that God has sent me to do this? Raise up your hand. You remember what the angel of the Lord said? If you get the people to believe you, be sincere when you pray. Nothing shall stand before the prayer. Uh, you know that's true. It's been proved over and over. Now, I'm going to ask uh, our sister Rose, if she will, to play that only believe or the great physician now is near or something. I want each one of you now in, in fellowship with me. Will you also, you people that was not in the prayer line, will you be praying for these people? Well, pr- promise them that by raising up your hand. I'll be praying for you. We all be praying. All right. now, I would that you would, if you have to leave, go real quietly now so that uh, they won't bother while we pray. You believe it'll be over now? Sister? With all my heart. Dear God, I lay my hands up on Sister. Challenge the affliction of her body in the name of Jesus Christ. May it leave her. Bless you, Sister. You believe with all your heart. All your sins are confessed. You're, as far as you know, you're ready to receive your healing. Dear God, I lay my hands upon my sister in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and ask that the affliction of her body will be gone in Jesus' name. Amen. All sins are confessed, and you're ready for your healing. You believe, brother? Dear God, I lay my hands upon my brother. As we know that you're present here, Lord, I pray that you'll heal him in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All sins confess. No, you don't hear. You believe that you will hear? You believe. Um, the woman's dead now. We will pray. Dear God, I pray that you'll heal our sister and take this deafness from her. She's sitting in a closed-off world where she cannot hear. I pray that you'll grant her healing through Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the people to keep your head bowed a minute. I want to see what's happened to her. I please, in Jesus Christ's name, let no one raise their head or eyes. Now, you mustn't do that till I tell you to. Can you hear me now? Here? So, 
Can you hear? She can hear now. You hear that sound? How you believe with all your heart. You will. And you believe. And God will make it completely well. She said, I just prayed and put my hands on her ears. And she said she could hear something. It's going now. Believe me. She'll be going to hear her. It's all sins confessed, sister. You're ready for your healing. Dear God, I lay my hands upon my sister. Knowing that in us is no good thing in ourselves. But we know that we are Christians born of the Spirit of God. And we lay hands upon our sister and ask for her healing. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now you believe you're going to be healed? You, you are healed. All sins are confessed. And you're ready for your healing. You believe by laying on of hands that the God who knows the hearts of the people will make you well. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you will heal our sister. As we lay our hands up on her and ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you'll make her well. Amen. How do you do? Of course you know I know what's wrong with you. But I'm just not saying it. Of course you do. It'll you just keep on going on and on. But if you will, is all sins confessed? And you believe that God will make you well? You believe the arthritis? I done said it so. Dear God, I pray that you will help her and make her well. Granted, in Jesus' name, you won't be crippled. You won't be with all your will. You believe that God will make you well? Amen. All sins are confessed and you're ready for your healing. You believe your back will be all right. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will heal her and make her well. In the name of Jesus Christ, may it be so. God bless you, sister. Go believe me now. As all sins confessed, sister, you're ready for your healing. Dear God, her sins, she said, is confessed. I lay my hands upon this woman in the name of Jesus Christ. Ask for her healing. Are right, all sins confessed? You must be right. You're very sick. You know that. You know that I know what's wrong with you. And you believe that God will make you well, heal your heart, make you completely well. Dear God, I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ that you will heal her and make her well. May this leave her, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Now, no doubt. Go believe me. Sins all confessed. You're ready for healing. Dear Heavenly Father, I lay my hands upon our sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed. Amen. No doubt. Go believe me. All sins confessed. You're ready for healing. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will heal our brother. We'll make him well. Grant it, Father. I lay my hands on him for this purpose in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. I believe it with all my heart. Are you believing now, sister? All sins are confessed and you're ready for healing. Dear God, I lay my hands upon the sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed for your glory. Amen. I just... Many times like that, just a touch, it's, Jesus said, these signs will follow them and believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, I begin to notice in the meetings, it takes effect 50% better than what it does when you call the people in line and have discernment. Because you only get to just a few in this way, there's many more gets healed. Have you confessed all your sins of unbelief and everything you believe now that you're going to be healed? Dear God, I pray that you heal our sister as I take her hands. And ask in the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. Amen. God bless you, sister. You believe now? All sins are confessed. Dear God, I lay my hands upon our sister in the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. Amen. God bless you, sister. Seems like a very small thing, but it's God and promise. Sins are confessed. Dear God, I pray that you would heal this, our sister. As I lay hands up on her, in the name of Jesus Christ, may she go and be well. Amen. Sins are confessed. Dear God, I pray that you will heal our sister as I lay hands up on her. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. As you come with the mechanics, may it strike the dynamics. It will go to work. 
sins are confessed. Yes, You're sir. Dear God, right, I pray that you will heal her and make her well. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. God bless you, sister. All sins confessed. Dear God, as this woman looks me in the eye, I believe that. I pray that you will heal her in Jesus' name. You're just bringing her, are you, sister? You're just bringing her. You believe, sister, that God will make you well? I believe. God could give me a high sight again. God bless you. Heavenly Father, you're always merciful to the blind, to the needy. Now they have seen what you've done tonight. So we believe, Lord, that this great last sign moving among us now. I ask for this blind woman's sight to come to her. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I report to us now. Report. Oh, yes. You believe that God will heal you? Dear Heavenly Father, I lay my hands upon our sister and ask that you heal her in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, sister. Let us hear how, you're, how you get along. you believe, sister? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray for our sister. Trusting that you will heal her now, I lay my hands on her. In the name of Jesus Christ. I believe. That's right. Just go believe. You believe, brother, all sins confess. Dear God, I pray that you will heal our brother and make him well. In the name of Jesus Christ. You believe, sister. Oh, God, I pray that in Jesus Christ's name, humbly in the sweetness and meekness of this hour, may the Holy Spirit make this woman whole. And I pray, pray for my son. I haven't seen him for 20 years. I pray that God will send your son to you, sister. Here. God bless you. Dear Father, I pray for our sister here. In the sweetness of the Holy Spirit, may he come now and heal our sister. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, sister. Dear God, I pray for my brother as he stands here and I lay hands upon him and as for his healing. In Jesus' name. Bless you, my brother. Little boy. Dear God, laying hands upon the little one, I bless him in the name of Jesus Christ for his healing. You believe now, sister? You won't be prayed for it, you? Dear God, I pray for her as I lay hands up on her. Now, uh, this is your commission. That's what you said, do. These signs shall follow them and believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. You said it. Now, he said that, didn't it? Have to be that way. Sister, dear God, I pray that you would heal our sister and make her well. In Jesus Christ's name. God bless you, sister. You come believe in sisters. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings on our sister. Just obeying what you said do. You said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, you said they shall recover. May I stop here just a moment to say, and this just to let the people rest a moment, just for a moment. A critic once said to me, that isn't so. But you see, he said, these signs shall follow. You've heard my message on that, on the trial, putting Jesus on trial. See, he told Noah it was going to rain. It never rained for 120 years, but it rained anyhow. He told Abraham he'd have a son by Sarah. It was 25 years later. He never said when. He said to have the son. 25 years later, it happened. See, he didn't say when. He said, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. God shall raise him up. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Is that what he said? He didn't say to jump up and do it right then. He said, they shall recover. That's his promise. That's what we believe. Come, sister. You believe that to be true? Then there's no way of keeping you from being healed. I lay my hands up on sister in the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. You believe, sister? Yes, All sin confessed and ready. Dear God, I lay my hands up on sister in obedience to your commandment and ask for her healing in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I want you that's being prayed for, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to report before these meetings are over what happens. And just let the audience, the other people, see what really takes place. Maybe tomorrow, next day, or when. You just watch what takes place. My mail has showed that it's it's so much different than just letting them try to test their own faith because Jesus said they lay hands upon them. They lay hands upon them. They shall recover. I get what he said. He didn't say they jump up and run up and down the floor. They could do that. But he said, they shall recover. Is that what he said? That's what he said. That's what I believe. And he's here now. The one that said the word is here to make it so. You believe, sir. Dear Heavenly Father, upon the confession of his faith and believing, I lay my hands upon him in Jesus Christ's name for his healing. Dear God, I lay my hands upon this woman in the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. Dear Father, I lay my hands upon this woman in the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. You said she shall recover. Ready for healing? Dear God, I lay my hands upon her in the name of Jesus Christ that you heal her. All right, sister dear. Everything ready for you. Your faith has now been met. You believe you're going to be well. And God, I lay my hands up on her in obeying your command. To all the world, every creature, I lay hands up on her in Jesus' name for her healing. Dear God, I lay my hands up on my brother in the name of Jesus Christ for his healing. Dear God, I lay my hands up on my sister. In the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. Going down the aisle. I just didn't want to weary you. You'll be all right if you believe that now. Thank you, Lord. Dear God, I pray that you'll heal my sister in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. To help me pray for these people. Now we got some handkerchiefs here and so forth in here to be prayed over. And I want you to continue to pray with me now. Now, these little parcels. Now, I know this sounds very strange for people to pray over a a little thing like this, but if you could only come into my office once and just watch. If we'd kept testimonies through these years, I suppose you couldn't have piled them on this platform. It's been healed just by sending out these prayer claws like this. Millions of them around and around the world. Now, you know what it is? It is... Will somebody get the handkerchief there for that? You know, you'll know your handkerchief with your brethren. All right. And I have seen little crippled children healed. And You see what it is? It's just a point of contact, as old Roberts used to say. It's just a point of contact. We pray. Now, we don't do this ourselves. We do this because the Bible commissions us to do this. We all know that's true. Now, there's many people that they anoint handkerchiefs and so forth. Well, now, we think that's all right. Sure. But if we just... The Bible didn't say that the anointed handkerchiefs, but they took from the body of Paul handkerchiefs. Now, see what I was talking about? Now, what they seen, that quickening power that was in Paul, that they knew he was God's servant, they know that God was in him. They know that everything that he touched was blessed. How many understands that? Say amen. amen. You know, I think Paul was quite scriptural in what he done. Don't you think so? Yes. You want me to tell you where I think he got the idea of doing it? From Elisha is right. See, Elijah said, take this staff and go lay it on the baby. Yes. And the prophet sent the staff because he knew that everything that he touched was blessed. He knew his position. He he could just get the woman to believe the same thing. Now, see, now the Bible never even said they shall pray for the sick. It said they shall lay hands on the sick. Now, just think, the people seen in the apostle Peter, the presence of God manifested in this man. Insomuch that they they even laid the people in his shadow and they were healed. How many knows that's scriptural? That's just as much scripture as John three sixteen. 
See, it's all God's word. Now, the people, you know, the shadow of that man did not heal the people. But look, if the power of God was up on that prophet for years and years after he died, insomuch that a dead man was thrown on his body, his bones, the body wasn't even there. The bones was there. And the presence of God was upon those bones until that dead man come to life. Now, don't you know that that same God that did all those things is right here tonight? To, to me, I think we should be the most happiest people in all the world. Uh, just think of this. I, I hope that I haven't impressed my audience to believe that it's something that I do myself. You, you know better than that. I, I am your brother, see, I am just a, your brother. But I do know, I do know this, that God is here. And I know that he has given something to us that we cannot explain it. Only by the word of God claims that it should be here at this time. So it also gives us identification to know that we're living in the last days. It gives us identification to know that this people, this chosen, elected, called out, predestinated. Now that's a big word, predestinate. But we all know that it's the truth. We absolutely know that the infinite God predestinated all things by foreknowledge before the foundation of the world. Even the Lamb was slain, and every name that would ever be on the book was put on the book before the book was ever written. Now, how many knows that's true? And Jesus came to, to redeem those that were in the book. In the Bible, the Lamb came from behind the curtain and taken the book and opened the seals that it was sealed with. For he came to claim all he had redeemed. He's the intercessor now. An intercessor, making intercessions for those who he has redeemed. All whose name was written on the Lamb's book of life is redeemed. As I made a crude little statement to the night, I'm waiting for the, all these handkerchiefs here. I'm not just trying to preach over again. But I said there was a little statement. I hope this don't sound sacrilegious. But... Like the farmer that set the hen and didn't have enough eggs, so he got an eagle egg. He set it under the hen and she hatched out an eagle. And he was a very odd fella amongst all the chickens because they didn't see things alike. But that's all he ever seen was the hen. He only heard one voice and didn't sound like his voice. Neither could he make a voice like the hen or the chickens. He didn't appreciate their diet as they eat from the barnyard. There's something different about him, yet he didn't know what the difference was. And then one day, there was a, the mother eagle that knowed she had laid so many eggs. And there was one of those eggs, which was to be her son, was missing. So she went hunting for him. And she found him in the barnyard. And she screamed. And when she screamed, the little eagle knew the voice of the mother. As Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. I think last night when I seen that panel of Baptist, Presbyterian, and what more, they might have been brought out under a hen. Excuse me, rather. <laughs> but um, Mother knew she had her darlings out there somewhere. <laughs> so that man standing there, not disputing the feeding they'd got from the mother hen and so forth, but now they're eagles, you see, they fly for their food. Thing. And I think the church is something like a scene I seen not long ago coming down from Tucson, or from, from Phoenix going to Tucson. I saw a mysterious sight. It kind of broke my heart to see what had taken place. How a hawk that used to fly in the air, a brother to the eagle, which is a type of the church in Jehovah, is the eagle. He called his prophets eagle. He called himself Jehovah eagle. But this hawk has long lost its identification. 
because it doesn't no more sail through the air and hunt its meat like it's supposed to. But it sits on the telephone wires and acts like a scavenger. He, uh, he hunts for dead rabbits that the cars is killed and him and the vultures get out there and eat together. He hops like a vulture instead of walking like he should walk. He's lost his identification. And I say this with all godly love and respect. The church has long lost her identification as a sister eagle. She sits around instead of digging into the Word and find where these things are right. She waits for a bunch of Sunday school literature has been made up by a bunch of intellectuals somewhere. Some dead rabbit that's been uh, killed somewhere else. Hops like a vulture. God help us to fly away from that. These promises are true. Not what somebody said about it, but what God said about it. They are true. I'm so glad to be associated with eagles. Let us pray together for our sick ones. Dear Heavenly Father, it's taught in the Bible that they're taken from the body of Paul, handkerchiefs and aprons, and demons went out of people and unclean spirits left them. Now, Father, me standing here over these handkerchiefs represents every person that's present. It's a body of Christ, us together. We are claiming by grace and love that we are here to represent his bride, and believing, associate with him in his kingdom. And we know we're not St. Paul, but we know you're still Jesus. And we pray that you will honor the faith of these people. If they lived back in the days of Paul, they'd have heard this same gospel, seen these same things. Therefore, they're the same kind of people. You're the same God. So I pray, dear God, that you'll honor their faith like you did those in the Bible days. And may every demon power, every sickness, every affliction that's bound the people, that's these handkerchiefs and parcels here represent, may that evil power of sickness leave them. It was said one time that Israel was walking in the line of duty to a promised land. And right in the line of duty, the enemy come and backed them up in the corner and the Red Sea cut them off from the line of duty. And in their march, God looked down from the heavens through the pillar of fire and the sea got scared. It rolled back its ways because God's ways was in the bottom of the sea and it made way for his children walking in the line of obedience. Now, God, if the Red Sea would get scared and roll back its waves, roll back its waters, and give place to a journeying children marching in obedience. Dear God, tonight, look down through the blood of your Son, Jesus, who made the promise. And when these handkerchiefs are placed upon the sick bodies of the people, may the eyes of God look and may that sickness, that devil, be scared and move away. And may the people keep the journey to the promised land with good health and strength. As Israel marched through the wilderness, there wasn't one feeble person among them at the other end. May it be granted to these people, Father, for we send these handkerchiefs in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, each one. As you get your handkerchiefs now, you believe with all your heart. Do you believe that God hears this? See, I, I want to say this. Don't... Don't doubt one bit. See, it may seem real strange. Excuse me. just. Don't doubt one bit, but believe now that what we have asked, God gives. Do you believe that's God here knows the secret of your heart? You know that believe that's God? Now just settle your mind out. It can't be nothing else. See? Now, what if there would be a grave tomorrow, way years ago? This will be history. And when people in years to come, if it was to be such... They come to say, well, if I would have been living then, I'd seen that done. Boy, that's all I would have had to know. I would have believed it right then. See, the same thing that you believe if you'd been back there when he'd done it then. Remember, it's still him. It's his life in you. God bless you.